The next part of this lecture is on extending global trend models as we worked with last week to local trend models. So first, just a very quick recap. We have the definition of the trend model as given up here, where everything is relative to the current point in time. And what we saw was that we could solve it iteratively by just adding and updating the uppercase F operator and the N vector here. And then it's just F inverse times H give you the corresponding estimate of theta. Now the question is, that was the global model, but in the beginning what we're saying is maybe we should find something that is more local. Say, recapping the wind situation there, what we saw there was either something that's going upwards, being stationary, or going downwards for periods of time. So maybe rather than having a fixed predictor, as in a mean value, we could have kind of a linear trend model. Maybe that's better, I don't know. So one way of looking at it would be to get inspired by the exponential smoothing and say we have the same power of lambda as weight on our prediction errors, which is usually just a one here. And this gives us, for instance, this weight here, when lambda is fairly large. This is around 0.95. And of course, lambda should be greater than zero and also less than one. And the story is the same. We want to find the lambda that minimizes the sum of squares errors here with these weights. You can say the weights that we have here are very close to what we did for the weighted least squares formulation. We can write it, have this, the residuals here, transpose, and non-transpose on the other side. If there was no weight in between, it would be an inner product. But now, if we have a diagonal matrix with the weights, we get exactly what we want. And for the weight least squares criteria, what we have in here is sigma inverse. So we'll just take the inverse of the weights here and use that in our calculations if we do it all the way through the weighted least square calculation. Now, the question is, you can say, the estimator here is then of course the same as for the weighted least square solution. So, so far, so good. The next step is, well, can we also do this in a nicer way? And yes, we can write it in a very similar way to what we did um, for the global model, we'll find the estimator using the same equation. All we have to do is to update the various terms here, and you will see that the lambda weight here comes in in the same way as we discussed last week, how to factorize uh, f of minus j and f transpose of minus j. Those will be outer product of and they will buy matrices with the dimension of the order of the polynomial in F, or could also be different from the polynomial. And then we just have the weight coming in here. One thing to keep in mind is that when lambda is not too big and J becomes large, this means that there's virtually no weight on old values. So maybe we'll take advantage of that in some cases. But first, we will look into the so-called total memory, or also sometimes called the efficient number observations. So now we have a sum of all the weights that we use in our model. Typically, if you have the global model, lambda equals to one. So this coincides with the number of observations. Come on. Um, and we get this fraction here, which is essentially the inverse of C from the exponential smoothing, because it's the same sequence of weights. And again, we'll notice when n becomes large, this is effectively 1 divided by 1 minus lambda. So, for instance, when lambda is 
0 0.9, we have 1 divided by 0 0.1, which is equal to 10. So the efficient, effective number of observations for lambda at 0 0.9 is 10. So the total memory is 10 observations. No matter how big n becomes, effectively you're not using any more than 10. That also means when you want to get an estimator for sigma, or sigma square, we can use the usual weighted sum of squares, but rather than dividing with n minus p down here, we'll divide by t minus p. This also usually puts a restriction on t, and thereby on the lambda, the minimum lambda, lambda that we can actually use, in this case, and I should just stress that this estimator is not in the book. Actually, there's no estimator in the book for this. There is an estimator in the book for the weight least squares where it says use n minus p here, but that's under the assumption that the variance of the epsilon follows sigma squared times uppercase sigma which is not the case here. We assume that they are all, you can say, just sigma square times the identity matrix. So that's the big difference, is that this uppercase sigma is not part of the distribution assumptions for the residuals. Now, as for the global model, we can also here make an iterative update. And you can say the equation for fn plus 1 is quite similar to before. For the global model, the only difference is that we add lambda to the n power when you add the last term in the outer products that are summed. For h, it's also just one place where lambda comes in. Um, so we forget the old, estimate, shift it backwards in time with the L inverse operator, and then we forget it by multiplying by lambda, and then we add with a weight of 1, as always, the most current observation with the appropriate uh, time shift of that, namely 0, and we get the estimator in the exact same way. So notice there is a lambda coming in in both the uh, both terms up here. And as initial guess, you can always just use a vector of zeros and a matrix of zeros for the H and F. There is just one thing to be aware of. That is, you can do this, but you have to wait a little bit. With, you have to do some updates before you can take the inverse of F. This was, this was also discussed in one of the exercises last week. Now, often, as also mentioned before, lambda to the n power times f of minus n, f transpose of minus n, will go to zero when m becomes large. So we could make a formula where we say that f becomes stationary. At some point, this will converge. Now, then we can also simplify the expression here because when this is a constant, basically we have to rewrite this as a function of theta and put it in here. So what we get is that we get the new estimate of theta by shifting our old estimate of theta backwards in time. And then we take f inverse of f0 on the difference between the most current observation and the prediction of that given the previous observation. So now we're down to a what you say one liner to get the update. And what you should notice here is that you have a factor on the most current, and then you have a combined factor on the previous estimator from here and there. A quick example. First 
recapping the example from last week but adding a little bit more it's the same six observations that we looked at for the global model in last week now what we'll then just show the linear form how to write the whole thing we know the estimator x transpose x x transpose y to get our theta hat but that's the you can say the linear model way what we'll do here is to do it the global tr linear trend way by first calculating f6 because we have six observations and h6 and then we'll solve for theta so the estimate at time 6 is 3.9 with a slope of 0 0.33 now this is just recapping from last week so I'm kind of squeezed it in together the linear predictor when we go forward or backwards in time relative to where we are is the following and the estimator of sigma square we can get that by taking the epsilon taking the inner product of the epsilons and divide by the degrees of freedom we had six observation and we estimated in two parameters which give us 0 0.453 square and for the prediction error epsilon 6 of l so when we shift time relative to this we have the usual expression like this sigma hat squared times 1 plus f transpose of l the f6 inverse and then lowercase f of l again as an example you can see the typical example is to make the one step prediction which gives us 4.234 with a variance estimate of 0.6189 square and we can also give a prediction interval in this case I just calculate the 90% prediction interval now if we add that we can here see the fitted line and an estimate and the 90% confidence interval and that seems reasonable what we also did last week was to say now a new observation arrives and what we'll do is to update the equations first for the F7 then for the h7 and finally for theta 7 so we get a slightly different uh, a lower estimate and also a lower slope and this was what we had before and if we add now the updated one after getting this observation here well that's lower than what we predicted before so that's not a big surprise that we kind of change the slope a little bit from here to there so that was an update on the global model from last week and how that behaves um, just adding the prediction intervals that were not there previously if we do the same thing for the linear trend model local linear trend model we pick in this case we'll just pick lambda equals 0 0.9 and we'll calculate f6 and h6 where the only difference is the lambdas here that are inserted so before we had a 6 here and minus 15 minus 15 and so we get just slightly lower numbers here and we can also see that we get an estimate of lambda which is fairly close to what we got before but slightly different and here we have our local estimator of sigma hat square which is the all the residuals given the most current estimate normalized by our diagonal of our inverse weights and times our estimates again and then using the total memory minus two parameters and we'll get a an estimate of sigma square that is 0.496 square if we again do a one step prediction from here the prediction is exactly the same so when you're making a prediction 
the lambda does not go into anything. The lambda or the weights only go in when you update your estimates. But of course, when you predict something further ahead in time, you will have an increase in the variance, which is also seen here. So first, just the drawing from before with the global trend and the 95% prediction interval for time 7. And then if we add the local trend for that, it's almost the same. But you will notice that the interval is actually more narrow than for the global trend model. Um, due to the, you can say that it forgets the old and puts more emphasis on the most recent ones that apparently in this case has a better fit. That may not always be the case. I should stress. Now I will just make a short break again.